Hello and welcome to We Work Together, a podcast about working in partnership to improve the health and care of people in West Yorkshire and Harrogate and the relationships between the people involved. In this episode, Partnership Director Ian Holmes talks to Richard Stubbs, Chief Exec of the Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network, about innovation, diversity, and why he'd like to take us to Austin, Texas. Morning, Richard. Um, so you're the chief exec of the Yorks and Humber Academic Health Science Network. Can you tell us a little bit about your career journey so far and how you ended up in, in that role? Morning, Ian. Yeah, I mean, I've been at the um, the Academic Health Science Network or the HSN for about six years now, which is probably the longest I've been anywhere actually in my life. But um, and I came I came to the HSN as a as a commercial director straight out of um, NHS England. But I think you know my my job. All my jobs over the last 10 years have, have all really been about when you kind of think think about it it's been about innovation it's been about spread it's been about culture but but it's they've all been around you know if, if you boil if you boil it all down how do we in the uk know what's best about the care that we deliver and how do you get that best to happen everywhere and i've tackled different aspects of this um so for instance you know one of the jobs i had previously was to create something called the the NHS Innovation Challenge Prizes. And that was all about, can you have a, a national programme of recognising and celebrating the fantastic work that our innovators do? Because that, that's a big that's a big part of the spread piece. You know, you've got to, you've got to create the conditions. So, so a lot of the work that I've done has been around, been around that. But I've, I've, um, I've got a very, um, I, I do a lot of talks on my career and I'm, and I'm always really keen, I think, particularly for BME um, colleagues who may be listening to talk about the fact that there's a LinkedIn version of my life so there's a there's a potted history of my career, which in hindsight, in the rearview mirror, you can make look incredibly, um, uh, you know, ex- attractive and 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 pre-planned, and nothing was you know further from the truth. It's um it's been a you know it's been an interesting ride, and it's been that you know it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride to get to where I am now. But um, all sorts of different fixed term contracts and different uh, opportunities. I um. I absolutely understand that. I've never had a real plan for, for where I'm getting to. You just you just look at the next thing and say that looks interesting and uh, and go from there. Sometimes, don't you? Um, so, in terms of the HSN role, what what aspects of that job do you like the best, and and what aspects of it sort of frustrate you? I guess as well. I mean, I love this job actually. Um, I love working for the HSN. It's a privilege. It's a genuine privilege, and I, I say that a lot because actually we're given the headspace to to really, I think. Uh, explore and think and, and investigate you know what what's the best of the NHS and um, and that's where we spend all our time um, which I think suits me down to the ground I you know I'm, I'm somebody who goes where where the energy is and normally when you when you find out what's working well you normally find you know enthusiastic upbeat people who are getting things done and it's a great it's a great place to be in most of the time but you also get to kind of live in the future which sounds a bit glib but it's true you know you get to work with some incredibly um clever people you know academics researchers clinicians inventors and others and and you know if you're somebody like me who's a nhs manager by background you can kind of just about grip onto their coattails and understand what they're talking about but you can readily understand how what they may be working on if spread across the country would just transform an aspect of our healthcare and that for me is the best bit the best bit is being able to see the future and say if you could make this happen everywhere, wow, wouldn't it be fantastic? I think I think the frustration is, as always, you you kind of have that vision, you have that inspirational first meeting, and then you kind of sit back and think, and how do we do it? And then that's that's when you just think, oh, you know, this is going to be inch by inch, person by person, you know, hearts and minds every step of the way. And you know, if we get if we get it done in five years, six years, seven years, it'll be a massive success. And I think. If you could change anything, then you know, that that's the bit. That's the bit yeah. I'd change. Yeah. Um. So, so just on that theme, then. So you, you said you've been in the job for for six years now, and um, and a big part of the role is supporting NHS organisations to adopt stuff that's good and that's out there that we should be we should be adopting and, and and using. Um. Have you noticed any changes over the last six years in terms of the receptiveness of 
NHS organisations to change. Because one of the, the things that's often been said about NHS organisations is they're brilliant at innovating, but they're not very good at adopting from elsewhere. And I'm just interested in your sense of whether you think that's moved at all. Yeah, I mean, it's still it's still the case, but it, it is getting better. And I think um, and I think our, our understanding of, of how to do that is also getting better. Certainly, the, the, the whole, I suppose, you know, notion of innovation isn't just invention you know innovation is is invention plus plus scale i think is something that leaders in particular understand a bit more now but also i think this you know stealing with pride type of mantra is something that's that's fantastically well used and, and understood so it's good so things have changed i mean i think when i came into the hsn and actually before then i was um, deputy director of innovation at nhs england it's a similar job actually but um but obviously on a national scale and in both those jobs I used to talk about the the virtual um, queue to my front door, which was, you know, all these fantastic innovators, both you know inside the NHS and outside the NHS. But they were there every, every morning in that virtual sense with that show and tell, you know, I've built this thing. What do you think? Is there a problem you can find that this solution fits? And that was the the kind of the we had it the wrong way around. You know, we had people coming to us. Um, you know, in the HSN world, in the NHS England world, you know, saying this is something I'm passionate about and and now we need to make the service um, flex in order to be able to fit it in. I think what's really changed in the six year period has been the NHS has got a lot better at both identifying but also broadcasting its needs. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think the long term plan and, and um, you know, the five year forward view both helped that, you know, it, it created that conversation. SCPs, ICSs in the same way put people in the room and started to say, if we could fix five things in this region, what would be the five things that would fix? And then that gives people like me the ability to then broadcast that out and start saying to innovators, both you know internal, but also industry as well, this is where our challenge is. So if you've got stuff in this space, you're going to have a great conversation. But if you're coming to us with stuff that just isn't on this list, then you know even though the value proposition stacks up, even though it makes logical sense and it's good for patients, then you're not going to get the appetite and the energy. But here, you know, whether that's cancer, mental health, inequalities, whatever it may be, this is where the action is. And I think that's been one of the biggest changes. It allows us to be a lot more selective about the kind of things that we bring into the system. So we can bring things into the system with a degree of confidence that that conversation is going to be welcomed. But also we can get involved at the earlier stage in terms of the work we do with innovators. So we can, we can especially for smaller SMEs who haven't got the bandwidth and the capacity to waste years on something that the NHS doesn't want. You can get in there early, you can have those those surgery conversations where you're saying actually if you could pivot towards yeah. you know, mental health or whatever it may be, this is where the market may be in the next six to twelve months and here's some evidence and some confidence about why that's the case and you can show them ICS, SDP place plans that says this is a market. So that's, that's been one of the massive changes, I think, for me over the last six years. But to be honest, the biggest change has happened in the last three to four months. And that's, you know, with, with the pandemic, that's where you've really seen action on the ground translating into phenomenal um, transformation at a pace that at a pace that I've never seen. We have seen huge um, progress in digital innovation, haven't we, in the last three or four months and, and the use of uh, digital means rather than face to face, uh, you know, um, contacts, etc. One of the risks, I suppose, that that poses is um, the issue of digital exclusion. So some folk are much better able to, you know, to access the, the facilities to work digitally than others. And um, what's your thoughts on that? And how do you think we how do you think we should address that issue? I think we, digital exclusion obviously is a, is a massive issue and it's something that we can never forget. I guess I've got a bit of a, uh, I suppose, a, a bit of an outlier view on this, which is that one of the things I think we do um, wrongly in the NHS is we believe that all service offers need to be accessible to all. And I think we're going to get co more comfortable over time with the view that you can segment our population. I'd, I'd much rather, I mean, don't get me wrong, we need to think about digital exclusion, we need to make sure people aren't left behind. But I'm quite attracted to the notion that if you have digital access to primary care services, which take out maybe 40 or 50 percent of a, of a GP practice workload in a way that can be easily dealt with 
for both the patients who want to access services in that way, but also for the for the um, clinicians and the and the and the team behind that delivery of that service. Then you're freeing up face to face capacity for the people who need it most, the people who may actually be digitally excluded. So I'm I'm really taken by this notion of as somebody who is you know touch wood you know fairly well, but also I'm unlikely to visit a GP practice between nine and five on a Monday to Friday. If I can deal with my thing in a in a digital platform and get out of somebody else's way mm-hmm. and eventually give the opportunity for somebody with you know chronic conditions to spend 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes with the GP, I'm all for that. Yeah. So for me, it's it's about not being too polarized in the conversation. Yeah. I think if we, yeah, if we get to a point where we're talking about digital exclusion needs to be minimized as much as possible. But if we can also be comfortable with the fact that if we can take out a proportion of our of our patients in a way that suits them and suits the the caregiver, then all we're doing is freeing up capacity for face to face. And I think that that for me is, is where I land on this. Yeah, that's really helpful. And, and thinking about it as a as a kind of a blended approach that's that's right for the you, you know the person at the end of it is, is is clearly the way to go, rather than it's actually it's it's got to be this or it's got to be that. I think that's really helpful. Um, one one of the other things that we've seen during the past four months is the is the impact of the, the the pandemic on Black Asian minority ethnic groups. Um, so we know that they are. Uh, you know those those groups are likely to have a high rate of infection, and and um, and, and that translates through to a um, higher sort of chance of complications, etc. Um, do you think, as a system, we're doing enough to understand and address those issues? And what else do you think we could be doing? So I think I mean I obviously you know I'm a massive fan and supporter of of the the attention this is being given in, in West George and Harrogate. I think the partnership certainly you know for my albeit you know fairly limited view of other systems this partnership is um an exemplar in terms of both the way it has um i suppose claimed accountability for the issue but also the very practical steps it's it's taken and and uh, you know i've been pretty close to that work and and it's stuff that i you know in my job of course my job is to find best practice and spread it and and actually your approach to how you're handling this is for me best practice that's needed to be spread and, and it's, it's something that we're doing so you know, it's it's it in a way it's innovation um, to me. Yeah. Yeah. Innovation doesn't always have to be about kit and tech and digital and, and, and whizzy gadgets. It's about saying this is how to handle it. So I think it's so the way that we're handling it in the partnership, the, the attention it's being given, the focus it's being given, the fact that it isn't a conversation that has to happen just because people feel well we need to now be talking about this because we're expected to be talking about this. I think for me the the, the clear evidence is the fact that the partnership was talking about this long before the pandemic long before Black Lives Matters. And I think that's one of the, um, I suppose, the, the the foundations that we're now building on as we come into this kind of more crisis mode. And we've got real work, real conversations, real commitment that's already been expressed that I think allows us to then take that to the next level. And I think that that for me is absolutely amazing. I think where we need to, to go next is we need to um, I suppose position health inequalities as 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 the reason why the partnership exists, the reason why the infrastructure is here. So it's still, um, we you know we we and I don't mean this generally to the partnership, but across the NHS, we still talk about the other. You know, it's still the other. Mm-hmm. We have our population, and then we also have groups that also need to be yeah. catered for. Yeah. And I think mainstreaming that. Um, is I think one of the one of the biggest next steps, and it's a it's a cultural thing, it's a conscious thing. It's you know how can we stop ourselves from othering other groups and having this notion of a default member of society in our mind, yes. and, and then there's also somebody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that I think is is something which will only ever come um, from in, inside people. Um, you know, it's 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 the same as other isms. You know, but you, you can't tell someone not to express an ism. It has to come from inside them. It has to be something that's felt. But certainly, I think in terms of mainstreaming the conversation, instead of in, in terms of saying this isn't the last item on the agenda, this is the first item on the agenda, and it's the biggest item on the agenda. That's how you start to see this as not something else that needs to be done, but the thing that needs to be done. And I think that for me is is the next step. And I'm I'm pretty sure this partnership will get there ahead of other systems in the country.
want to move us on a little bit in terms of the um you know the wider sort of ICS and the health and care partnership so um you know obviously the academic health science network is a is a partner within the the ICS and an important partner within the the ICS what what do you think makes that relationship work what why do you think it's it's working as well as it is working yeah i mean it's interesting isn't it and i think it's something which has really improved in the last you know two three even maybe four years now but i i I think it starts with um, two things. One is, I think there's a, a credible evidence base of the types of innovations that we can bring to the partnership. So back to what I said about, you know, this virtual queue, in a way, you know, looking upon the HSN as a bit of a filter for the partnership. How do you take a thousand emails that all offer, you know, promises of of innovation and, and greatness, and, and whistle them down to the fifteen conversations that the partnership needs to have. I think is something that we're very conscious of in the HSN, and you're kind of only as good as your last referral, almost. Um, so that's something we take really seriously. But ultimately, it's about relationships and it's about trust. And one of the things I think that's really enhanced the relationship between the HSN and the partnership has been the clear level of joint accountability that we've all had. For delivery of of these programs, you know, we have a we have a range of programs that we believe, you know, very passionately are things that um, would benefit um, the population of West Yorkshire and Harrogate. And instead of saying, "Well, off you go," then uh, you know, we kind of give you permission to to travel around the, the patch and, and make these things happen. We're doing it together as a team, mm. and that I think is the biggest um, single um, uh, variable that has really transformed the relationship. Is that if you guys buy into something that we think is good, we all then say, how do we collectively make this happen? And it, and if we went into barriers, it's our collective problem. And I think that that is that is great for our team because they feel like they're part of a of a bigger something. But I think that's also the way that that things get can happen. Just on that theme, then, what are the things that you think we might do better, or what do you think the next steps are in terms of you know further kind of reinforcing and cementing the relationship? I mean, I, I think whenever I think about, you know, the reset of, of the NHS and, and you know, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about reset and and working on is there an opportunity here in the midst of a crisis to to really radically change our notion of what health and healthcare looks like. And and maybe there's an inflection point here where if you look back with a long lens, you know, hopefully 50, 60 years time, people will look at 2020 and say, is this the point at which the NHS absolutely moved from a 1948 model to, you know, the, the 2020 model as we know it? I mean, and, and I hope it is. But for me, going back to your point, is about West Yorkshire and Harrogate, the partnership. This is a place that makes things happen. So, I think the next stage of our conversation, the next, you know, how do we make it better, is to say, so what are you really up for? You know, what does a radical shift in care delivery look like from an innovation and transformation? point of view and and are we up for this because this is going to be really tricky this is all culture this is all hearts and minds yeah. this is this is fear about um you know is is ai going to destroy jobs across the patch this is fear about are we going to be turning um highly experienced um hugely um capable um clinicians and staff into into digital you know people sat in front of screens all day and and of course this is not the vision but that's the that's the fear. So I think there's a real leadership role for the partnership to to have a conversation with itself and with its staff and with our patients and our public to say, are we up for this? Are we up for this collectively? This is the kind of thing it could look like. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's things like you know. So you know, some of my favourite innovations are the really well. I call them the simple ones. I mean, they're not. But I guess what I mean by simple is they're simple to understand. Um, you know, that's often things that just need someone's smartphone to use like Health IO and its urine testing system. And it's about saying to people, look, this is the way we've always done care because this is the way we've always done care. But actually, did you know you could get something posted through your um, letterbox, you open the box, you do your sample, you do your own dip test and you use your own smartphone to take a picture. That's it, end of. Yeah. It's 10 minutes, people love it. 96 year olds across the country are doing it every day. And it's a paradigm shift in our thought process of how you deliver that kind of service and mm. and there are thousands of examples like that and it's it's about saying you know are we really really up for just transforming that type of understanding of what care might look like yeah 
Yeah, you know, I think as we've shown the last few years, we're already up for that conversation. So it's something we can all look forward to. Um, you get to travel all around the world in this job, um, which is I did. <laughs> you did, yes, <laughs> for the last four months. Um, I guess um, so. This question is about you know, based on what you've uh, seen and learned from other health systems all around the world. Um, you know, what would be the one or two things that you'd think actually, if we could just do this in West Yorkshire and Harrogate or across Yorkshire and Humber, it would make such a difference. What are those, you know, brilliant innovations that you've been most impressed with? I guess. Yeah, and I think, and I think I've got like um, two two examples from kind of different different ends of the spectrum. I mean, I think I spend a lot of time in the states. Um, we're doing a lot of work taking UK companies, Yorkshire companies, out to the states and and getting them embedded in the UK, US um, healthcare system so that we can start to create more jobs back here. And I think if you look at somewhere like um, Texas as an example, and you look at um, Houston in particular, and you look at the Texas Medical Center, it's it's like cathedrals of care you know the, the money the investment that they put into um into care providers is astonishing and i know obviously there's a difference um well, for starters we haven't got the oil that houston has but um you know there's a different model here but the intertwining of health and the economy and understanding that i suppose that symbiotic relationship between you know, better healthcare means better innovation. Better innovation means creativity, means jobs, it means spin outs, it means growth, it means better health. And, you know, that virtuous circle, I think, is something that you can see. You can see it in front of your eyes as you're, as you're walking down the street at the Texas Medical Center in Houston. Um, and I think, especially with the work that we're doing in the partnership around MedTech and around all the great capabilities we've got in this region, we're at the foothills of that. But that for me is is one thing we could learn. And Austin actually, you know, mm-hmm. sticking with Texas, Houston obviously has decades and decades of doing this. But I spend a lot of time in Austin, which is probably more of a lead sized city. Um, and you can then look at Austin and say, this has happened within 10 to 15 years. And and Austin is now flourishing as an economy in terms of um, you know headquarters from all around the US coming into Austin um, because of the quality of life. Um, and a lot of this is, is healthcare driven. It's um, it's amazing the, the relationship when you dig deep and you find out how important it's been for the the tech industry, the innovation industry, and, and and health, of course, being a big part of that. So, so understanding that relationship and using it to power our our cities, I think, is is a big thing to learn. And and looking at a place like Austin as a case study and saying that's what we could be. That's you know that's exactly how how we could do this. I think is something I've taken and. You know, if I could have one wish, we would just take West Yorkshire leaders over to Austin for a couple of weeks, which is you know not likely to happen, is it, in the, in the near future? But just to just to just to hear that story firsthand, because I think yeah. I find it fascinating. But at the other end of the spectrum, you know, thinking about spending time in India, and to a certain extent China actually, but, but mainly in India, you look at the work around frugal innovation, and, I, and I'm a massive fan of of frugal innovation. Um, you know, this isn't always about getting more and more complicated and technical. In fact, sometimes it's about being really simple and. And sometimes, you know, necessity being the mother of all invention, you look at the health outcomes from the way that, um, you know, certain um, chains in India deliver their cataracts, for example. And you just think we've got a lot to learn there. Um, You know, there are there are um, uh, pathways of care that cost, you know, far less than they do in the UK, even when you allow for you know, um, wages and the differentials in, in cost of living and cost of provision. And yet the outcomes are the same, if not better. So there's a whole piece of work that we could learn around from around the world about frugal innovation, how to do things cheaper, smarter, better outcomes. And um, yeah, it's a bit different from the Texas model, which I don't think they do frugal, but uh, certainly, yes. you know, we could, we could take stuff from both those examples, I think, and, and, and both those examples would make us richer. That link between the, um, you know, the, the the health system and the and the wider economy and that symbiotic relationship that you described really well. Obviously, there's the West Yorkshire devolution deal, which was announced just before um, the lockdown. What what are your aspirations of of that deal as a potential accelerant for some of this work? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? About, I mean, one of the things that. Um, devolution I don't think will come with um, outside of Manchester is you know the devolution of of the health and care 
That's right. system. It is, you know, this is this is a this is outside of that. And I think from an, as a fan of the NHS and very much keen on that N, you know, I'm a big I'm a big advocate of that. So devolution isn't about can we manage our our health services better because obviously they they are well managed as they are and it's better to be I think nicely within the mothership of of the NHS. So then you think, well, so what is devolution going to do from a healthcare perspective? And I think for me, the biggest thing is to start to get health leaders to recognise their their leadership role, their strategic leadership role in the kinds of economic growth conversations that will happen as a result of devolution. And that's very true, obviously, for the West Yorkshire deal, which is you know hugely significant. And these are the conversations that you know I know I know you guys are starting to have, and and they're the right conversations. But it's about saying, particularly in a living with COVID era, you know, we're about to go through a massive recession, if not depression. There will be um, areas of the country hit harder. And we have to recognise that that's a that's a health challenge, um, if yeah. nothing else. Yeah. So how do we as health leaders start to have conversations on in economic growth forums um, to make sure that devolution investment is spent in a way that's going to generate the kind of drops that are going to maximise health outcomes? So, for example, in, in an economic renewal plan, you can look at jobs at any cost, or you can look at good jobs and good work. Yeah. Know that you know health outcomes are going to come from giving people um, jobs that give them a platform to excel and to improve and to upgrade their standard of living. That's going to help their kids to get into better education. That's going to help them to get better housing. All those things are going to factor into our health outcomes. So it's about influencing those kind of conversations. You know, do we want to be known as an area that focuses on on logistics, jobs and other types of low paid wages that aren't really going to do anything other than trap people in a cycle of of economic decline? Or are we going to see it as a as a health investment? And are we going to help our leaders who will be holding those devolution purse strings to have health as one of the investment factors yeah. as they make those decisions over the next two to three years? Yeah. Last question from me. Um, if you had to pick one thing uh, in the last six years from your role at the HSN that you're most proud of, you know, think actually we, we delivered that and that's led to this improvement for people. Um, what would that one thing be? Oh, gosh, there's so many of them. Um, this is one of those, you, you know, can pick which, two, then, if you want, which is your favourite kid? Not <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to I'm going to. Um, I'm going to wimp out of naming a particular innovation because I just have you know 299 innovators on my back saying I can't believe it wasn't me. Yeah, but what yeah. but the thing I think the thing I'm personally most proud of actually is is some a piece of work that I started last year, which is it's back to the diversity agenda we were just talking about. But specifically, it's around diversity and innovation. And I kind of realised with a bit of horror actually that although I've always been passionate about diversity, passionate about workforce representation, particularly the snowy peaks and all those kind of um, cliches that we know about. Despite working in this field for like 10 years, I'd never really thought about diversity within the within the realms of innovation research. And obviously, spending a lot of my time in kind of academic circles, clinical academic circles, those kind of things, you realise that actually it's, it's quite an interesting demographic of the people working in those kind of jobs. So I did a piece of work um, for the HSN, but also nationally for the HSN network, which was really around trying to start to um, showcase why greater diversity and innovation is important. And, and for me, there's two things. There's one is we need to ensure that the kinds of people with uh, great ideas are what well, we, we, we are farming those ideas from all sections of our workforce and all sections of our society. You know, if if just over 90% of our of our staff are from BME backgrounds. If they've not got access to our innovation pipeline at any point, then that's 20% of our of our potential ideas or or solutions for the future that just are never going to get heard. So there's something about can everyone with an idea, can everyone with an innovation have the same kind of access to the kinds of support that we give to our innovators? That's thing number one, I guess. And and within that, of course, we talk about the demographics of the people who naturally inhabit those kind of jobs and what can we do to improve that. 
but also it's about the business case about why that's important i mean it's important for our staff it's important for 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 how we run our organizations but also it's important because when you look at the innovators who do come from diverse backgrounds almost always you see that they can approach solutions or they can come with experiences which improve the innovation in a way that perhaps we wouldn't have got if we'd have just got those kinds of solutions from somebody from the white majority. So I'm talking about diabetes programs that are born out of experience of, you know, diabetes in Southeast Asia, for instance, or or things that recognize, um, you know, the language barriers to particular, you know, we talk about digital exclusion. Mm. People who come up with language barrier um, solutions in, in digital tech, those kind of things. But there's almost always a, um, a beneficial layer that's placed but kind of baked into innovation when it comes from somebody from a diverse background. And I think recognizing that we talked about, you know, COVID, we talked about health inequalities, we talked about how do we mainstream our service and our thinking of people from um, different um, communities and backgrounds. Having diverse innovation from diverse innovators, I think, is a really important part of that. So so that's what the, the work is all about. And I'm really proud of it. It's it's got traction, you know, it's sticky, it's, yeah. it's known about, yeah. and it doesn't end, I guess. You know, we, 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 we're continuing to work, we're continuing to work with people like the um, the Shuri Network and others. So it's, yeah, it's probably the thing I've done most that kind of came directly out of my head and has, has landed and has, and has stayed. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that.